In this video, we'll look at completing the sailing rig and we'll deal with the never-ending details. Let's get right into it. In episode 11, I talked about all the different rigs a whaling boat could have carried. I mentioned that for a model displayed with the sail up, I personally like the jib-headed high-peaked gaff rig. If the boat is down-rigged, a more modest gaff rig is all that's really needed. And since most of my research concerns the beetle boat on display at the Nantucket Whaling Museum, it makes sense that this would be the sail plan I'd use. So where do we start? Let's start at the top with the shrouds. Now, making the shrouds, like all the rigging on the whale boat, is pretty simple. There were usually just two pieces of 5 eighths inch or 3 quarter inch rope. A common method was to seize the two shrouds together near their ends, and that would form an eye. Now these were seated over the mast on a shoulder cut into the top three or four inches of the mast for that purpose. And there was sometimes a pin running through the mast to prevent the shrouds from unshipping during use or during down rigging. That's optional. The eyes were typically served to cut down on wear, but that was not always the case, especially if it was a repair done at sea or a replacement. At the other end, there was sometimes a thimble turned into an eye splice. Other times, there was just a naked splice. The lanyard needed to secure the shroud to the boat was also spliced into that. The sheet was just a 5 eighths inch piece of line spliced or tied onto the boom at a point where the boat header or the mate could control it easily. No blocks, no pulleys, just a rope. Now the throat halyard is likewise uncomplicated. It's tied or spliced round the gaff jaws and led up through the shiv in the mast. Now in this page from Ansel's book on whaleboats at Mystic Seaport, the dotted line represents the peak halyard missing from this boat. As I mentioned in episode 11, he assumes that there had to be one to control this end of the spar in the sail, but it somehow got lost along its way into the museum. Anyway, I am including it on this model, even though in the final display it won't even actually be visible. So this will go out about two-thirds of the way from the jaws and run through a fair lead or just a thimble seized to one of the shrouds. Now, with the three control lines in place, I can now bend the sail to the spars. Now, I don't have any special or clever way of doing this. I just use silk sewing thread and a needle for all of it. There were five mast hoops on the rig and they go on first. Now I'm using footage from a larger scale project here because it's a lot easier to see what I'm doing, but the process is exactly the same. It scales up or down very nicely. And an added benefit is my knuckle warmers aren't in the frame quite so much. So I start by attaching the line to the sail, then it runs through the hoop and then back through the original hole I made earlier. Now this is something I try and do consistently. I don't want to end up with a lot of little holes for each hoop. Not a good practice. I repeat this three times, and then I seize the end round the lashings with a clove hitch, glue it, trim it, and move on. The head is laced onto the gaff. This sail was loose footed so there's no other lacing, just the forefoot being tied to the jaws and the outhaul. Now that the sail is on the spars, it's time to stow it down. And 
And a brief discussion here, just for a moment, about the style of display. I know it may seem a little abrupt and out of place here, but the manner of display will have an effect on how certain steps at this phase are carried out. To show a whaleboat model with its rig properly stowed, the heel of the mast would most likely be in the tabernacle, and its upper end, along with the rest of the rig, which would be much more neatly and tightly furled, would be lashed to the cutty boards aft and to starboard of the loggerhead, more like what you see here in this photo. Historical accuracy and context would have me show the boat this way, but for my model, I'm claiming my right to artistic license and visual drama over absolute fidelity to context. I'm also paying homage to one of my mentors, Colin Gray. I learned a lot about building whaleboat models from Colin, and this was one of his favorite ways of displaying the subject, and it's become my preferred method too. For me, it has to do with the angle at which the rig overhangs the stern and the hastily furled sail that added to the already graceful sweep of the shear. It lends a sense of motion and activity and balance as your eye moves over the model from bow to stern. Now keep in mind, this is just one way I display my whaleboat models. And consideration of the visual aspect of the display can have a large effect on the model's impact on the viewer. Back to the present. If you are a subscriber to my channel, you've probably already seen the videos I did on how to make and install Silkspan sails. If you haven't seen them, I strongly suggest you hit that little white bar and dot up at the upper right hand part of your screen. Then come back to this. Also, episode 11 has some pointers on working with Silkspan. Now, the reason for using Silkspan over any other material becomes very clear in this step. Off camera, that little sail you see here, I sprayed that very lightly, just a mist of water in a, from a spray bottle. No need to soak it, just a light mist, then let it sit for just a minute or so. And all on its own, it will become very workable. And then I start folding down the luff along the mast. The folds will form naturally and alternate port and starboard. And the trick here is just to get them to look natural with no flat spots, hard bends, or sharp corners. Just nice round folds is what we're looking for. And once this forward end looks good, I start furling the rest of it. Now, if you've watched the other videos about the process, you will have noticed me using sail stops. But these are only temporary, just to help me deal with an uncooperative sail. And that happens from time to time. In actual practice, there would not have been any time to use sail stops. The crew would have likely been otherwise very occupied. Now, also, as I noted in um, episode 11, I was trying something new with this sail. And that is reducing its height by about oh, 20% or so. And at the beginning of this clip, you saw that truncated sail installed, and it was not nearly as high up on the mast as you might expect. Now, I really had no idea if whether or not reducing the bulk was going to make a significant difference in how the sail furls and the ease with which I could do it. So I was very surprised at how much of a difference it actually did make. The sail furled up so smoothly, and the whole process which can sometimes take what can feel like an eternity, took 90 seconds start to finish. That's half the amount of time it took me to explain it in the video. So 
Moving on to stowing the whole rig. And here you have a couple of options. Now, once the sail is flaked down, you can remove it from the mast, lay it alongside, and secure the whole thing with the shrouds and the running rigging. Now, the second option is to leave the sail and the gaff and the boom on the mast, as you saw me do with this particular whaleboat. If you look carefully in this clip from Down to the Sea in Ships, you'll see the crew has the sail and the spars off the mast. Maybe because the sail they're dealing with is so much larger than the sail I'm portraying, doing it this way probably makes it easier to quickly stow the rig. For this model, as you've seen, there really is no need to bother taking it off the mast. But whichever method you choose, the means of securing it is the same. All the rigging is wrapped loosely around the rig, and the whole thing is wedged under the number five thwart. Now there's a mast shock to the starboard of the loggerhead, and it has a lanyard for securing the rig to the cutty boards. In this photo, you can see the position of the rig as it will be in the finished model, but this is just temporary, just to give you a visual reference. I haven't made either the chalk or the lanyard yet, but that's about to change. Now, the mast chalk is a simple item, and as with everything else on a whaleboat, there are endless variations. But since the chalk will be completely covered by the rig, it really is kind of a low visibility, or I should say invisible detail, that could easily be omitted. But why why bother when it's just so easy to make one? The one I've been using is about as simple as it gets. A block of wood with a groove cut in the center to receive the mast and the spar. In front of it, and in this case, running through the rail is the lanyard to secure the rig. So between being jammed under the last thwart and lashed to the chalk, the rig isn't going anywhere. As you see, this lanyard is left oversized. And it will stay that way until the rig is permanently installed later in the assembly process. Now, I'm going to spend the rest of this episode on some of the whale craft I've been neglecting. I won't get to all of it here, but I promise we're getting close to the end. I'll start with three pieces that, like the mast shock, could easily be overlooked or forgotten. They're the hatchet and the two knives. All three of these pieces of cutlery had one purpose, to cut the whale line if it became necessary to save the boat and or the crew. The hatchet was stowed at the riser up near the clumsy cleat. One knife was usually kept in a sheath mounted to the limber, and the other knife was stowed in a sheath on the cutty boards. Now I'll go over making the knives first. How big are these things? I use examples in museums only as a rough guide to the general size and placement. As far as I can tell, there was no such thing as a standard whaleboat knife. It was just a blade the size and weight of which was suited to the task. So here, you're free to indulge yourself, within reason. No machetes, no Swiss Army knives. As you saw in the earlier photo, my two knives are not identical, and they are fairly crudely made. Now, since they'll both be stowed in their sheaths, the only thing actually visible will be the handle. So I am not prone to spending a lot of time on these when, the, when they're displayed this way. I made the knives for this model with a five inch handle and a seven inch blade. That might seem a bit on the large side, but it had to be able to cut quickly through a piece of three quarter inch rope. So a seven inch blade really doesn't seem excessive. And again, 
This is a detail that I've only seen in museums and read about in books. What the reality was is certainly open for debate. But what I've done seems reasonable to me. The blade, full-sized, is three-eighths of an inch long, or one foot in full size. It's made out of four thousandths aluminum. And the handle is made from two pieces of any scrap than wood I have lying around. It's glued up, sanded and shaped, quick and easy. The two sheaths are also made from small scraps, roughly shaped like the knife and slightly hollowed out on the underside to allow the blade to be inserted in. And, of course, you're free to bypass this whole process by just shaping the sheath, gluing that in place, and then gluing a small piece of wood at the end to represent the handle. Now, the hatchet is something I spend a bit more time on. It's made up of two pieces, the handle and the business end. Now, like the knives, the exact shape and size are, within reason, open to some interpretation. I made mine to look like the hatchet I measured at Nantucket Whaling Museum, but in truth I have no way of knowing if this is an actual hatchet that would have been on a boat. I only have the museum's display to go by. In any event, if you're in a quandary about the dimensions, a quick trip to the hardware store should answer your questions. Things don't really change that much in this, in this neck of the woods. Anything reasonable will do. The only detail I would deem really necessary to include would be the hole in the handle for the lanyard. And the lanyard would be roved through a hole in the riser to keep the hatchet in its place. Now, the cooperage. There's an awful lot of cooperage in a whaleboat. There are line tubs. There is a bucket for wetting the whale line, a lantern keg, and a freshwater cask, and a baling piggin, and one or two drugs. Now, there are two styles of drugs. As you can see here, one, which was a small keg sealed at the top and bottom and a means of attaching it to the whale line, and the other could just be a piece of flat board stock with a similar means of attachment. These were used to add drag to the whale line in an effort to tire the whale more quickly. Seems like a good idea in theory. But I have to think, a 50-ton adrenaline-stoked whale pulling a boat full of people and equipment through the water at close to 20 miles an hour would probably not even notice it. Still, they're a part of the boat's equipment, and they will be included. However, this model will get the flat boards. They take up way less room in an already crowded boat, and they're easier and faster to make. Now, most of the cooperage needed is a variation on a theme. They're either going to be buckets or casks, and all are made basically the same way. So, I'm only going to demo making a lantern keg here, just because I like making them. And it was, arguably, one of the most important pieces of equipment on the boat. It was not uncommon for a whale to tow a boat completely out of sight of the mothership. And if the crew had to spend the night on the open water, they relied on that cask to provide them with some salt beef, some ship biscuit, a lantern that they could hoist up the mast, some tobacco and some matches if they were lucky enough to have a pipe, now, when you're the only living thing for miles meant to be living above the surface of the water, having a few small necessities must have been a great comfort. Now, just a side note, I'm using the lathe here to make all of these pieces, but they can all be done without one. It just takes a bit longer. Until I had a lathe, I clamped my drill to the workbench, and that was my lathe. A bit crude, yeah, but it worked. So, whichever way works for you. Now I have a blank that I've turned down to the widest diameter I need, 
and I mark the piece for its overall length. The chamfer you see at the forward end is not random. It's actually the finished diameter at the top of the keg, which happened to be 12 inches or 3 eighths of an inch at scale. So all I have to do is join the bottom diameter with the top. Now when I get close, I switch from the skew chisel you see me using to emery boards to get the surface as smooth as I can, down to about a 400 grit. Next, I cut the recess in for the lid. Then, I indicate the individual staves, just penciling them in with a number two pencil. Now, this seems pretty intense right now, but they will barely be noticeable by the time the piece is finished, as you'll see shortly. Now, I used to scribe the lines in with an X-Acto knife, but it always left too many loose fibers standing up and the furrows were too deep. The stave lines are supposed to be a detail, not a feature. The pencil lines are much neater, more subtle, and best of all, no wood fiber standing on end. Now, staining and weathering comes next, along with a lot of buffing down with a paper towel between applications. Now, the iron straps are done exactly the same way here as they were for the line tub so you may need to refer back to that episode. That was episode 12. Look to the upper right of the screen for that length. Now all that remains now is to part it off and make and install the handle or a wire bale. Your choice. And that's the lantern keg complete. After making this piece, the other bits of the cooperage shouldn't give you any trouble at all. Now, if your hunt was successful, you now had a very heavy inanimate object that had to be towed back to the ship. And that's where the tow line and the toggle come in. The four-foot boat spade, I built the one way back in the beginning of this series, is used to cut a hole in the whale's lip. The toggle was roved through the hole in the lip, and the other end was made fast to the boat. And the hard work began. Now according to Willett Ansel's book, the line was only a quarter of an inch in diameter and it was about 33 feet long. It seems like kind of an odd size to make it, but I don't know why. But I made it 33 feet long. And it had a nice splice in one end and the 15 inch long toggle at the other. It could be served to provide durability. Ansel makes no mention of the toggle's diameter, but examples that I've seen in museums seem to be in the three to four inch neighborhood. The one I've made here is a bit over three scale inches, and it looks about right. Here I've got a 3 seconds dowel chucked up in the lathe. I've marked the length and the center, and I'm just using some files to impart the taper and make the groove in the middle. This is all done by eye. When it looks right, it is. The line, which at this scale is about five thousandths of an inch in diameter. Silk sewing thread is just about right for this. It's attached to the toggle with an angler's knot. In actual practice, this would have been an eye splice, and as I mentioned earlier, probably would have been served. Now the other end gets an eye splice, or to be more precise for this application, a marlin splice. And the last thing to do is to coil up the line and put a hitch on it. And that's the toggle and tow line complete. Now the grapnel, there's just no denying making the grapnel can be a real pain in the ass. I either get this right on the first try or I clear my calendar. In his book, To Build a Whaleboat, Eric A. R. Ronberg Jr. describes his method for making this piece, and I've used it for years. Thank you, Eric. Looking at the diagram and reading the caption will tell you all you need to know. And this will either be oddly satisfying 
or an exercise in frustration, or both. And that brings us to the close of this video. Next up, it all comes together. I detail making the display and the joys of fitting 10 pounds of whale craft in a five pound boat. And of course, the myriad details associated with trying to make this thing look as though it could actually have worked. Oh, and you really, really don't want to miss my comprehensive guide for building ship model cases for the complete masochist. That all comes your way very soon. I also want to thank all of you for your patience and support over the long course of this project. Two more episodes to go, and I promise they will follow quickly. So make sure to turn your notifications back on. So until next time, remember, treat each other nicely. Now, breaks over. Get back in the shop.